Hi, I'm Sarah Sudwick, and thanks for tuning in to my video on color mixing and edges. These are clips from a group demonstration I did for my online art mentorship students in June 2018. If you'd like more information about my online art mentorship program, you can find that at sarahsedwick.com, or you can email me at sarahsedwick at gmail.com. I hope you enjoy this video. Thanks for watching. So let's look at this real quick. And one of the things that I do that I purposefully act to do when I'm creating an underpainting is to figure out where my lost edges are. The hard edges and the soft edges kind of fall in line for me automatically behind the lost edges. And I'll explain that a little bit more, I, I hope. But first, I use this as a note taking system to find my lost edges. And so, where are they? Here. Okay, it's not as easy to see it over here because the camera is drawing a line for you at the edge here. But when I look at this in life, I don't see a huge contrast here and I want this edge to be lost because I have strong contrast here, because I have strong contrast here and up here is I think gonna be also, maybe not quite as much here. But the viewer will then believe me that it travels and continues to travel across here because I have shown this and this very strongly. That's what I want. I want to do that. The camera is defeating me here by saying, oh, no, wait, no, we want to tell you and show you and remember that there was a line. But in my eyes, I don't see it. So here's a lost edge. Here's a lost edge. This is overlap, and I'm gonna show that it's overlap. It's not as nicely spelled out for me here in the underpainting, but I'm gonna show that this one is in front, both by the fact that it's lower down, okay? But also by the fact that you're gonna see this coming in front. It's darker, this is lighter behind. You're gonna, you'll see, so you'll see the contrast here, but it's like, I'm always saying, to you guys, to my workshop students, and to myself in my own head, what's the contrast that's showing me the form? The only way that I can ever see what's going on in my still life, in my painting, is through contrast, visual contrast. So I have to ask myself, how am I seeing what I'm seeing? How, how do I know that this is in front of this? It's not super obvious in my underpainting, unfortunately. But of course, I can see it up here. And so what's the contrast that's showing me what's going on? It's that this is darker than this and that this line is curved like this. And I am going to show that. But here, it's lost. There's no contrast here. So that'll be a lost edge. And I've shown it to myself a little bit in my underpainting. Now, where else? Maybe here. Definitely here. And then here, this is also closer to the edge of the picture plane than I think it is on the canvas. Uh, but this is gonna be a lost edge. And so what about hard edges then? Kind of the way I, I do it is I find the lost edges, I find my hard edges, and that's more of an intuitive thing with me now, but any edges that aren't hard or, or lost are gonna be soft automatically. So where are my hard edges? Here. And how do I decide that? Because when I was looking at this and making decisions like this still life is right now, I'm going to paint this still life. This teal shape behind the bright orange was one thing that was really drawing me to this painting, to this setup the way this is. I like this breaking the plane of the, um, breaking the edge of the plate, breaking up that contour line. I do not like to do plates and bowls where the rim is continuous. I have this broken in two places, here and here. And there's a couple of reasons that I don't like to have a continuously unbroken rim in a painting. It's hard to draw, and it's boring. So hard edges. So I was really drawn to the contrast between this bright saturated orange and this dark but still saturated teal. I, I thought it was beautiful and this is a beautiful shape. And these are getting a lot of light right here. It's just a no-brainer hard edge for me. I see it that way, and I also want to paint it that way. 
So where else will I have a hard edge? Probably here, because we have contrast. Probably here, where the highlight is. And probably here. But so, I won't have a whole lot of other really hard edges in this painting, I don't think. Here, this, this will be us, this light side. So I'm gonna put the hard edges on the light sides of the apricots, basically, where there's strong light dark contrast. And all the other ones are gonna be soft. How soft sort of depends on how close or far away they are from the front. Or if they're like the edge of a shadow, usually very soft, especially the back edge visually. Notice how the front edge of the shadow is a bit more defined than the back edge. That's almost always the case. You can see it also over here. Front edge of the shadow harder than the back edge, but none of them are hard edges. Cast shadows rarely have really hard edges. It's just a hierarchy, harder in the front, softer in the back. All right, any questions? So how am I gonna start? Before I even ever start painting, I will do the underpainting and then I kind of let it sit and sink into the canvas a bit. And I will mix colors on my palette for my subject matter. So looking at my still life, I'm gonna start mixing. And what I wanna do is mix something for the light parts, the light side and the shadow side of each object or area of my painting. Minimum, before I start painting, I will pre-mix that. So what do I want to start with? Probably let's, let's do the apricots and let's say the lighter side of the apricots is orange, right? So I'll start with some cad yellow and some cad red and I'm going for a light saturated orange. I want to point out that color mixing, I use the palette knife like a spatula. I scoop the paint onto the front of the knife I flip the palette knife over and I mix the paint by pushing down into the palette with the top, the offset part of the knife. I see a lot of painters mix with the back of the knife like this. Is that clear the difference between scooping onto the front and pushing to mix and mixing with the back of the palette knife against the palette? Neither way is wrong. This is just the way that I like to do it and feel that it's most efficient. So try it my way. Then you can go back to mixing with the back of the palette knife if you want. Scoop onto the front, flip over, push to mix. And if you try to keep the paint toward the front half or third of the tip of the palette knife, it's a lot easier to get it off by just pushing down. I don't ever recommend scraping the knife against the edge of the palette. And this is one of those disposable palette pads you'll just make a mess if you ever go near the edge. So that said, we're mixing for the light side of the apricots. Cad yellow and cad red to make an orange. Now I'm gonna add some Hansa in just to see what happens. Color mixing is a journey, you know? Especially with this few colors around the outer rim of the palette, if you take something too far in one direction, you can almost always walk it back just by adding the opposite. So don't ever think, oh, I'm going to screw it up. I can't take a risk. It will become mud, it will be unsalvageable. Even if it doesn't end up being perfect for the area you were aiming at, there's a very good chance it'll be useful for some other part of the painting. So don't be afraid to take a risk in your color mixing. When I'm mixing along, doop de doo and something becomes really, really close to something else by accident. I'm doing it on purpose now, but generally it will happen on it by accident. I'll just mix them together. I'll say, oh, well, that became the same thing. Let's put that together. And now I can divide it in half and move that over and make it different. So let's make it different. Let's make it greener because I do see a lot of shadows over there that are greenish. They're like a greenish orange. What a strange oxymoron, but they are. 
And when we have a light value color like that yellow orange of the apricots and you ask yourself, what's, what's the shadow? What's that? It's like dark yellow. I've talked to a lot of you about dark yellow lately mixing for the shadow side of the lemon. So what is dark yellow? Yellow is inherently a light value color. The dark yellow is gonna be either a green or a brown. And so these dark oranges that I'm mixing are browns. Maybe I want some that are greener than others. I've put a kind of a test strip on a drawing board. And so on the easel, I've got my canvas and a drawing board and I put a test strip of paper up here. I don't usually do this. Often I will just be mixing along. Now all my mixtures feel like they're upside down because I mix them the opposite way. But so usually I will just be mixing I'll have the palette on the table and the canvas on the easel and I'll say, okay, well, light, light side of the apricots, let's try it. And I'll just take it up to the canvas and kind of give it a smudge and say, well, how does that look? Yeah, that looks okay. But maybe it could use a bit more yellow. Maybe I want some orange that has a bit more yellow in it. So I'll pull half of it off to the side and I'll mix in some yellow. What a mess I made out of this yellow, huh? One of the main arguments for palette knife mixing is that you keep your source piles cleaner that way than dipping the brush in, but you gotta wipe it off in between. <laughs> that's the key. Okay, maybe I want something that's a little more yellow. Maybe I want a little bit more white in it. Because I'm working with this Hansa yellow that's very transparent. Adding just a little bit of white sometimes will help that. And so then I would say, okay, so look at that. Even just those slight changes that aren't that visible on the palette. We're talking this to this. Is that real visible? It's hard for me to see much difference there, but I know it's different. It feels really different up here on the painting. So I will not probably leave those palette knife marks. And if I decide I don't like it, then I just take it off and put it back on the palette. But so why do I have this color drip up here. One option for testing your color mixers is here on the painting, but you can do something like this. The difference is that this is white. And here we're painting onto a surface that's primed with this orange. That's going to be a difference. That's going to make a difference. The colors are going to feel different against that orange tone. So I can tone my test strip. That's an option or not. Why not? Tone the test strip. Give it a little wipe. And test them up here. So let's say now I've got light side of the apricot. Let's see if the shadow colors I mixed work. Go into that. And maybe even this darker red. If you're gonna do this though, hmm, I don't know. If you're gonna do this though, you, you really need to pre-mix quite a bit because you'll use up some paint doing this. And so separately from having to worry about drawing, I can test the colors up here and get an idea of whether they're gonna work together without having to worry about drawing. Let's test the plate. Well, that is just extremely saturated. That's this. That feels very, very bright. Maybe for one or two spots of color that will work, but for the most part, 
That's better. That's a bit more toned down, but I think it's too green. Feels too green to me. So that was this one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull in a little bit of ultramarine blue, which is that warmer blue to try to cut down on some of the coolness that I was feeling in that. But now it's, it's just lightening. Ultramarine blue is, it's darkening, I mean. Okay, so now it feels less green, but it's back to feeling more saturated. A little bit of alizarin crimson, that feels good. Okay, so I added a little bit of alizarin crimson to it and a little bit of white. And now right here, that feels the most like what this area feels like to me. But just trying different methods of testing to see whether your pre-mixtures are working or not, because you know it's not great to launch into your painting and then flounder around like, oh my gosh, these colors are, none of them are working. It's just another way to check things. I usually test my mixtures right on the canvas with the palette knife. But if that doesn't work for you, try this. You know, you end up with a bonus little mini abstract landscape. And another yeah. way besides just looking at your palette to see how your colors all look right. together. It's a good idea. So once I'm pretty happy with my color palette, I can start painting. And the question often is, where do you start painting? How do you start? So I have a value structure already set up with this underpainting. I know where my darkest darks are, so I don't have to start with my shadows. Because I already have some idea about how dark my darkest darks are and where they're going to occur. So where I want to start is with something that is an easily diagnosable color. An easy win. Something that I can get right fairly easily and then judge the other stuff against. Often for me that comes in the light. See color more easily in the light. I want something that's really it's too dark. Distinctive. How about this light saturated part of the blue plate? There we go. So I really like to carve out my dark shapes by coming in with light shapes. So that would mean paint the cast shadows on this plate first and then come in and paint the light part around it. But I do want to start with this color so that I can judge the value of those cast shadows against it. That's the lightest and most saturated part of the plate. If I've established that that is what that is going to be, then none of the other parts of the plate are going to be as light, bright, or saturated as that. That is the limit. The hierarchy has been established. And I find that very helpful. 
because now I can say that if I see the plate getting a little darker, as it comes uh, a little darker as it comes around behind that orange, that orange is an apricot. And that's what I'm going to make it do. And I'm going to keep everything else on this plate in line with that first parameter that I set by putting the lightest and most saturated color first. But now that I have this on my brush, this, this area, this little shadow area back here, I can say, well, what else is like that? Is it like that as it comes around up here in the front? Yes, it is. Very similar. And then maybe I see just a little wedge of that there too. I'm not that concerned about staying inside the lines of my underpainting right now. I'm going to get a lot of opportunities to work back and forth 